this video is about my gear, what guitars I use, how I do my recording. So this one is my namesake guitar, it's the one that my YouTube name is made from. It's the Ibanez RG470. It's a 2000 model, made in Japan. The only original parts of it is the body and the neck. Everything else has been customised over the years. Um, I mean, it's, it's a relatively cheap guitar. It was only about four hundred and seventy pounds in two thousand, so it's not high end by any means. Uh, so the neck, the body is basswood. The neck is maple with a rosewood fingerboard. It's got twenty four frets and the customizations. So I'll go from head to, head to toe if you want. Um, the tuners are Grover locking rotomatic tuners it's pretty unnecessary on a locking guitar to be honest but i like every possible way to make that tuning secure so i'll just get a locking tuner and i wanted everything to be chrome so chrome everything including the pickup rings which were originally black plastic and i just didn't think they looked particularly good so i changed them for chrome they're actually the original black plastic is still on that it's just a chrome over the top the bridge is an original Floyd Rose, again purchased in about 2005. I had to do a few alterations to get that to fit. Um, from this side I had to drill larger holes for the mounting studs because the original Ibanez low TRS or whatever it was called, they were pretty small so I had to drill that out which I was shitting myself about when I did that. I thought I'd fucked it when I did it because I drilled not quite straight. And um, that works really well. And I had to raise, I had to put more shims under the nut because it was too low. And for the back, I used three springs, the same Floyd Rose ones that come with it. Um, but what I do, because if you play with a tremolo guitar, you get you get a lot of resonance through the strings because all the all the springs just vibrate. And so what I do, if you've ever bought aftermarket pickups, specifically with the Seymour Duncan style ones, you get bits of foam. And what I do is, it's actually a tip from a friend of mine, he suggested to cut up little, little bits of foam and actually stick them in the spring. And if you, if you put loads in there, really compact it in there, it dulls the springs so it doesn't get any string resonance and it doesn't affect anything else of the use of them and that's a really handy tip electronics wise all the pickups have been replaced with Seymour Duncan T what do they call them TB6 so it's a Duncan distortion trem bucker and matching distortion neck uh, the middle is actually an Alenco 2 so it's a really strange combination because it's two ceramic high output pickups with a really low output middle I didn't like overpowering middle pickup sounds so I went low output just to get a bit of a blend but still maintain that kind of clarity of the outside pickups and I ripped out all the tone control circuitry because I didn't I didn't use it I like bright sounding guitars and if I want to make it dull out I'll do it on the amp rather than on the guitar and it meant that the rolling off of the, of the volume it stays really bright all the way down to the very lowest setting. I hate the fact that when it rolled off tone, it rolled off volume, it would just dull. I thought that sounded really cheap, so I ripped all that out. And I thought, what could I put in place? And I was a big fan of Tom Morello at the time, Rage Against the Machine, and I liked his on-off switch that he used, so I put an on-off switch in there. And I've done that on a few of the guitars. And I just like the fact you can just turn it off like a light switch. So the selector switch itself is still wired in the same Ibanez fashion, so bridge is the bridge. The next one is the inside coil with that middle. Uh, the middle is the middle on its own. That is the inside coil of the neck with the middle, and that's the neck on its own. And I actually put in a coil tap switch as well. Instead of the inside coil with the middle, when it's down in the bridge position, it's actually the outside coil and the middle instead, which is actually really, it just gives a brighter strat sound. 
So when I'm in the bridge on its own, it's just the very outside coil, which is funky as fuck. It's a bit too bright sometimes, but it's, it's quite handy. And in the outside, it's just the neck outside. So it gives you nine combinations instead of five, so it's quite cool. The trem block on this is a Tysonics titanium block. And if anyone's ever changed a trem block, it makes a lot of difference to my ear anyway. I'd say it helps with the sustain quite a lot and it also brightens up the guitar because I just want them to be as bright as possible naturally so I can control that in the EQ. Uh, I think that's it for that one. So this one is the Gibson Les Paul Standard 2014 model. It's the 120th anniversary version. It's a little 12, 12 fret inlay there. And uh, this is the one that I use on, well, it's the Crazy Train guitar. I didn't buy it as an off-the-shelf 2014 standard. I bought a body blank from America, and it literally came as no hardware, just the wood. And the reason for it is because I was looking at getting one at the time, and I didn't like... I knew I wanted to change the pickups, I knew I didn't like the e-tune that they had going on, and I knew I would want a locking bridge and various personal things that I do with the tone earlier, electronics, so I just went, you know what, I'll just buy a body blank and put everything on it myself. So this is, I think, I think it's a honey burst. It might be a desert burst, but I think it's a honey burst because it's a bit too light to be desert or tobacco verse, whichever they call it. So again, with this one, I put on Grover, locking tuners, and it had to be chrome again, because it's a standard, so it had to be chrome. Uh, Grover locking tuners, I changed the little plate. It said E-tune on there, so I got a, an American standard to make it look a bit more legit. Um, this thing here is to, to deal with the string resonance, because when I was recording, I noticed a bit of, it just rang out when I did stabby chords, so I thought, where's that coming from? And I remember James Hetfield seeing videos of him recording, and I thought, do you know what, that, that works, so I'll leave it on there. It's not pretty, it looks fucking terrible if I'm honest, but it's cheaper than buying one of those furry 15 pound muters that you get. I thought, I've got shitloads of masking tape, I'll just use that. So the pickups on this are, Seymour Duncan JB and a Seymour Duncan I think it's the Pearly Gates it's, it's in one of their sets I can't remember what the set's called Hot Rod possibly um, standard switch no, nothing special there bridge and tailpiece are the Tone Pros locking stuff because I just want it's everything to be locked down I don't want any tuning problems or funny shit going on and I do the little thing where you wrap the strings over the top because it gives a little less tension on the strings and you don't break I have broken them a few times and so I wrap them over the top to just take that break angle off a little bit so it's a bit less extreme electronics wise there's only one there's one global tone control neck volume bridge volume but they're also coil splits they're push pull so you pull it up, spits the coil on both. Because I like the fact that you can get a Strat sound on the Les Paul. Do a bit more clean, funky stuff. And this is actually a dummy, a dummy control. It doesn't do anything as a volume or tone. It is literally an on off switch masked up as a tone control. My love of uh, on off switches. And this one just has locking straps, locking strap buttons. Uh, that's it for that one. This one is a 1987 Gibson Les Paul Custom. I bought it on eBay, and it is a real one. People, you know, I've had some knobheads that say, oh, it's a fake. It's just like, yeah, yeah, you can't afford one, but you know, some people can. 
we're lucky that we can, but we, it is a real one. It is nearly stock. I think the original tuners are still on their Grover ones. And uh, it's a, I think it's a Heritage Cherry Burst, but it's quite a dark one. There's no flame on it at all. But there is a lot of figured wood finish. It's quite transparent. Because it was quite old and, and it's gold, there's a lot of tarnishing going on with it. So I took off the original bridge and tailpiece and pickups and covers because I didn't want to tarnish them any more than they were. And I thought I can keep those in a box somewhere. It's a Seymour Duncan Jazz Neck with a cover on it. A new cover, not the old one. And this is a Burst Bucker Nail Bomb, not Burst Bucker, Bare Knuckle <laughs> Nail Bomb pickup. And it's really cool. It's quite a, a warm sound to it. Uh, the bridge tailpiece are a Japanese brand called Goto, G O T O H. And they specialised in just aftermarket hardware. These are lightweight aluminium ones, which for a dark guitar brightens it up a little bit. Uh, the wiring is exactly as it was, except I've changed the knobs also for Gotto dome knobs, because I don't like the Gibson, never did really like the design of the Gibsons, and I like the knurled edges on these. And I just wanted to give it a little bit more of a, a modern twist to it. Uh, this one, the one I used on Bark at the Moon, it is a, uh, it's a warm-off custom, and I knew I wanted a double humbucking guitar with a string through, but I wanted it flat. So to get a flat string through, I actually ended up having to angle the neck slightly back using, pretty sure I've got some old plectrums under there. I'm sure there's better ways of doing it, but it works pretty well. Just to bring off, bring up the height a bit to get that tailpiece break angle, sorry, the bridge break angle to be enough that it didn't affect the intonation. So this is a mahogany body with a maple top, flame maple top, Brazilian rosewood neck, and it's an ebony fretboard, but it's it's not the black ebony, it's got some, something else, it's got like a tiger stripe figured thing through it. Grover locking rotomatic tuners, had to be that. It's a double bound guitar, so it's got binding on the front and on the back side. No colour on the back, it's just black. Um, two Seymour Duncans, I think this one is a, I think this is a custom five. So it's, a, so it's an Alnico 5 custom pickup, and that is a jazz neck again. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so it's a bit hotter than the JB, a little bit less mid, I think, than the JB. Tone Pro's locking bridge and string through body. On off switch, single volume with the coil split, and then the standard Les Paul three way. Um, and I use the resonance damping method of masking tape on the bridge and the nut just to really tighten that up. I was doing, I think I was doing a slip knot cover, and I needed it to really be to have no resonance in there whatsoever, and that really, it really cut it out. I knew that I wanted a fat neck, so I, I had the fattest neck that Warmoth did. It's like a baseball bat, but my hands are quite big. And also stainless steel frets as wide and as high as they came. I think it was like a 65, 50 fret wire, which is just super high. And the action, I actually like really high actions on guitars, believe it or not. Uh, last one is a Fender Telecaster. It's a USA Hot Rod 52, I believe. I don't know what year it is. I think it might be about 2007, 8, 9, something like that. And it's it's virtually stock, except the bridge pickup was changed from whatever it was originally. I didn't do it, actually. I bought it off someone who'd done it. 
and it's got a Seymour Duncan hot something. I don't know what the order's called, but it's basically something that just gives it a bit more of a humbuckerish sound while still maintaining the Telecaster twang. Um, yeah, not a lot to say other than this is just a standard issue guitar. Seymour Duncan <laughs> something in the neck. It's like a mini humbucker. But it's a great sounding guitar. It's a classic Telecaster. I do love a maple fretboard. Uh, yeah, it's just a great sounding guitar. I don't use it very often because I don't do a lot of songs that really require a Telecaster. Yeah, it's just cool. Uh, in terms of my recording stuff, I use a Fractal Axe Effects for all the sounds and a Jim Dunlop Cry as an original Crybaby. And that's literally it. It goes into a Line 6 Relay G55 wireless which is overkill in the bedroom, but because I can, I did. Just say I'm so used to it now that I don't even bother using the cable. I use Cakewalk Sonar X3 Producer Edition for my DAW. And for the most part, I either make the backing track myself or I use a backing track that I found. For a lot of the Guns N' Roses stuff, I've used backing tracks that I've done myself. So I've programmed in all the drums and played all the instruments myself. Um, otherwise, I'll just find one on, on YouTube or something that passes the quality test. It has to be pretty good. Uh, there's some decent stuff out there now. People are doing a lot, some really good jobs with backing tracks. And so my monitors are Yamaha HS7 monitors, which are great. They're fucking loud. And they, they're just quite flat response, so they, they give a very true sound. And I use a Motu, Mark of the Unicorn, M-O-T-U, Audio Express, Audio Interface, just for like inputs and to get a digital input to the, to the fractal. And that's it really.